get the weather. Like there's this crazy weather out in Denver. My friend's ski trip got canceled. Crazy weather in Charlotte, North Carolina. There's tornadoes. They evacuated the tower. I mean, it's just been crazy. And I got stuck overnight in Charlotte, North Carolina after American, I, I wasn't going to say the airlines, after a certain airline company continually backed up their departure time. And then at 2 a.m., finally canceled the flight. I'm not mad. I'm not bitter. I'm better. Okay. So anyway, it's Paul Moore and Wellings Capital, and I need to make sure you can hear me. So if you can hear me and you're in Facebook land, please let me know. I got to hear from you to know if you can hear me. If you're in bigger pockets land, let me know. I got to hear from you to know if I can be heard. It sounds like some kind of a, like a, a philosophical statement, but I actually just need to know. And I don't see anybody on YouTube yet who said they can hear me. So that's troubling. But anyway, I'm going to get started with uh, today. We're going to talk about it's tax season. Why you may want to fire your real estate CPA or your CPA in general. Okay. Thanks. Dude. Real estate is here. Nate Shields to the rescue. Nate Shields is a writer on bigger pockets and he is going to be helping me out here. He's also a coach and a mentor. He can answer your real estate questions if you're on the YouTube side. Hey, Nabil, Mahmood, we can hear you on the Facebook side. I love it. Okay, so we're going to talk about why you might want to fire your CPA. Now, if you're a CPA, don't shout me down because you're hopefully, if you're listening to this show, the type of real estate CPA that people need to hire, not fire. But if you are the kind that needs to be fired, then you need to be changing your mindset to be the kind that needs to be hired. So I hope that made sense in four hour, three and a half hours sleep. So before we get going, we're going to hit 50. No, how about 10 reasons not to invest in real estate? 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. Here we go. Number one reason not to invest in real estate. You really love your savings account. Good thinking. Okay. Uh, reason number two, not to invest in real estate. You like paying taxes. It's your duty, right? Number three reason not to invest in real estate. You'd rather own paper than a physical building. Number four, your mattress would not be as comfy without all that cash stuffed under it. Number five, you're wary of the term mailbox money. Number six, you want to make sure your stockbrokers get their fees. After all, they don't make very much money, right? Okay, number seven, you prefer buying CDs, either the banking product or the music variety. We won't judge. Number eight reason not to invest in real estate. You'd rather work for your money than receive passive income for doing nothing. You remember the song from Dire Straits, Money for Nothing and Your Wealth for Free? I added that. Number nine, you want to teach your kids good old-fashioned values, including putting every penny into your checking account. That's smart. And number 10 reason not to invest in real estate. You don't mind losing money to inflation. Life is more fun when you know the money you've saved is worth less today than it was yesterday. Okay, I hope that was helpful. So uh, if you have a question on the YouTube side, my good friend Nate Shields is going to try to answer it. And uh, so Nate was dude real estate. He's going to be going back and forth with many of you while I tell you why you may want to fire your CPA. Now, my friend's name, Ed. Hey, Curtis. Thanks for joining. And by the way, if you join and you want to tell us where you're from, we'd love to hear and what you do. So tell us where you're from, what you do. And, you know, give us a little shout out, thumbs up, heart, love, all that stuff. So I don't get fired by bigger pockets. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, okay. Ali, thank you from, I can't really read where you're from Connecticut. Okay. So, um, my friend Ed in California, he actually had a CPA and he worked at the CPA for about a decade. He was making a lot of money as a real estate broker and also more importantly for our story as a real estate investor. Ed was a sharp guy, but he wasn't a CPA. He didn't know all the tax loopholes. Well, one day after about 10 years with the CPA, Ed met a, actually he read an article 
about some tax deductions, some powerful tax deductions for CPAs. So uh, Ed uh, contacted, not for CPAs, for real estate investors. That's what three and a half hours sleep will do to you, Nate. Um, anyway, um, he uh, talked to his CPA. He actually took him to lunch and said, hey, I found this thing here about cost segregation and I've got all these properties and it looks like it would save me a ton of money on taxes, but I wasn't using this. Have you ever heard of this? And his CPA said, well, sure, I, I've heard of it. And Ed kind of dumbfounded said, well, why didn't you, you didn't tell me about this, you know? And then Ed brings up something else, you know, some other tax saving thing. And the CPA said, yeah, that's right. That's right. You can do that. And Ed goes, well, why, why didn't you tell me this? And the CPA actually had the gall to look across the lunch table at him and say, hey, I'm your CPA. I'm paid to do your taxes, not advise you on how to save on taxes. What? He actually said that. He said, I'm not here to advise you on how to save. I'm not a tax strategist. I just do your tax returns and fill out your financial statements. Oh my gosh. So Ed, understandably pretty upset, fired that CPA and he got a new one. He got a tax strategist. This tax strategist is a CPA who actually looks at the big picture. He looks at everything that you as real estate investors are doing. He looks at the good, the bad, the ugly, how you've set up your corporations, how you're filing your tax returns, how you do your mileage in your home office. Those are simple things. Um, are you doing a cost segregation study? Are you accelerating depreciation where you can? Are you taking advantage of the new 2017 tax laws from the real estate investor in chief up in the Oval Office and his friends inside the Beltway? Now, there's all kinds of tax savings opportunities. So let me tell you what happened. Ed, in about 10 years since he fired that CPA and got a tax strategist, He's, he's a legitimate guy. He files legitimate tax returns from what I can tell. Ed has paid exactly, goose egg, zero in taxes. He's paid zero in taxes where he was paying, are you ready? Over $120,000 a year. He went from $120,000 a year, that's about $1.2 million in a decade. I knew math. Thank you very much. Um, and he went to zero taxes in the next decade, at least from his investment real estate. He might have made, paid taxes on his other stuff, like his brokerage. Isn't that powerful? Well, this is something that you can do too. And I'm not saying you'll get the same results, but you need to make sure you're working with a CPA who knows how to save you on taxes. I just had lunch with a guy yesterday at Chipotle in Chicago. I told you I flew in from Chicago and boy, are my arms tired, right? Okay, that's so corny. Nate, stop me. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, he said he spent like $400,000. Wait, no, no, no. I think, I think he spent several hundred thousand dollars in taxes because he didn't set up his sale right. And if he'd only known, he could have saved that in taxes. A good friend of mine who's 70 years old, who I'm going to see tomorrow, he just made like over a million dollars in some speculative... Um, uh, Bitcoin ICO, believe it or not. It wasn't Bitcoin, but it was another one. Thanks, Nate. It was another one of those uh, coin offerings, you know, initial coin offerings. And he made over a million dollars and he didn't even think to ask his CPA till he sold it uh, what he could do to save on taxes. And I said, dude, if you would have come to me a day before you made that sale, I could have told you how to save possibly like walk away with 93 or 94% of that instead of like 60%. So anyway, I'll tell you one more story. My son, he is a real estate land flipper. He buys and sells timber tracks. He uh, buys and sells uh, large properties and here in Virginia. And he came home the other day and he goes, hey, I made $147,000. How much do you think I should owe in taxes? I said, I don't know, maybe 30, 35. He said, yeah, I owe like 47,000 in taxes. And I said, well, you've got an LLC. Are you dividing your pay into salary, like a reasonable salary for your 
hours plus a separate profit for your investments? He said, no, no, I don't think so. So I looked at his tax return and I'm not even a CPA. He's got a smart CPA, but this guy didn't divide those. He just threw it all into wages. Well, he had to pay FICA, which is Social Security and Medicare, on the whole thing. On the whole, I think it was 147000 Instead of having a normal salary for his time and efforts, which would be, let's say, 40000 50000 a year, and then the rest of it, like the other 100000 in profit for his investing, which is what it was. Well, he paid an extra twenty. I think it was 15000 more than he should have. And I said, don't file that tax return. You need to get a tax strategist. And my friends, that's what I'm telling you. As you get smarter, as you get better, as you get more deeply invested, uh, you, should, um, you should make sure you've got a CPA that actually cares enough to dig deep and figure out the best strategy for you at a high level. They may cost more, but they're probably going to be somebody who can really help you. So let's see who on here can help each other. So we got Walter Dietschweiler in Wisconsin. Hey, Walter, should you be fired or not? I got, I got to know, you're a CPA. So based on what I said, I'm guessing you're not one of those folks that needs to be fired. Thanks for joining us. And please weigh in, Walter. If you disagree or have some comments, I'll try to, to, to bring them to the front of the line. Although I've got probably over 100 comments here on the YouTube side, but I'm trying to get to everybody. So Nate Shields, Dude Real Estate, is answering your questions on the YouTube side. I'm going to see if I can answer a few more questions, a few questions on the Facebook side. So Brad Wagoner from Louisville, Kentucky. I was just there looking at a mobile home park. Electrician by day and buy and hold real estate investor by night and other times single family houses looking to go to multifamily. So Brad, there's a good book on multifamily and... It's called The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings by Steve Burgess, B-E-R-G-E-S. And I would recommend that. And if you're looking for a mentor in uh, multifamily, there's a lot of really good ones out there. Uh, I used a mentor about six years ago. I went through their program and I couldn't have been happier with how that went. So uh, Mark from Bridgeport, Connecticut, truck driver. Okay, you already talked. You already talked to me. Oh, that was Ali. Okay, Ali said the same thing as Brad. He's looking to go into multifamily. Okay, commercial apartments. So Ali, I actually wrote a book called The Perfect Investment. And uh, it's about jumping up from small multifamily into large multifamily. And uh, so if you've got a question or a comment on the Facebook side, it's already gone because I only can look at four comments at a time. And I know you think I'm not a millennial, but I really, you're welcome, Brad. I really um, seriously um, uh, can only see four at a time. So copy and paste it back in. If you've got a question that Nate Shields, dude, real estate hasn't answered on the YouTube side, please copy and paste it back in. Uh, Brad, okay, David Long says, do you suggest an LLC for flipping? and one for buy and hold, or can both be in the same LLC? David, I think unless you're getting into a really, really large situation with a whole lot of volume, I would say you can probably go with one LLC. Now, I'm not an attorney, and I'm not a tax strategist, and I'm not like Walter. I'm not a CPA, so I don't know. Walter, what do you think? I'd love to hear from you and any other CPAs or attorneys. Should he get more than one? Uh, LLC, I would think one, and I think that most attorneys would tell you as long as you're not at a very high volume, one. Uh, but I'd love to hear from the rest of you. By the way, you may not, um, you may notice I don't have answers for everything. I know that's a shock, but in, in even dude real estate, Nate Shields might not have answers for everything. So please answer each other's questions if you can. That'd be awesome. So if you've got a question on the YouTube side or on my pals over here on the bigger pocket side, please copy and paste it in now because we're going to wrap up a little early today. And so please copy and paste if you've already asked and you haven't got an answer, please put it back in. David Long says, I've got 19 rentals and just started my first flip. David, 
I mean, you you know, like for for safety, you may want to divide that into two or three. That's quite a few. You may want to divide that into two or three different LLCs or start a new LLC at some point. Um, I would talk to uh, Scott Smith, Scott Royal Smith, Bigger Pockets contributor, Royal Legal Solutions in Austin, Texas, and ask his opinion. And there's also some uh, web uh, articles. Matt Faircloth wrote a great article. My good friend Matt, I just saw him in Chicago two days ago. Check his article out about why and how you need an LLC. Brandy Bruce, is it true that LLC, hey Brandy, can affect you negatively when it comes to getting property if you're dealing with banks per se? I don't think so, Brandy. My son actually buys them in his name and then sometimes transfers them to the LLC. Uh, but you're still on the loan. So you're still a non re I mean, uh, it's a recourse loan and you're still going to be um, on the loan either way. I don't see any reason it should affect you unless you're trying to buy it and not look like an investor. So therefore you make it, you put the offer in your name, you make the offer assignable, and then you assign the contract over to your LLC before or at closing and you should be good to go brandy uh thanks for joining us okay uh we've got brad wagner what is the number one thing people forget to claim on their taxes as far as real estate goes i would say that people don't know how powerful the cost segregation study is and that would be one thing number two uh the section 179 and the other accelerated depreciation benefits that come down the pike from the 2000 uh, December 2017 tax uh, ch relief laws. Uh, I think that would be another thing that people wouldn't know. You know, you can actually write up to, off up to 100% of the first 15 years of deductions if you do it right. This is beyond the scope of this particular presentation, but I'll say if you can accelerate your real estate depreciation schedule, anything with a 15, 10, seven, five, or three year life can possibly, and not counting goodwill, can possibly all be written off in the first year. Wow, pretty cool. And a lot of people don't know that. CPA should know it. I bet Walter knows it. I'm picking on Walter now. Where'd you go, Walter? Okay, Lisa Reed says, I'm interested in real estate. What would you recommend for a beginner? Um, Lisa, I would recommend considering getting a single rental unit, renting it out, hopefully from a friend or maybe a, a new apartment building that's not all filled up yet. Furnish it and make it into a long-term corporate rental. And then um, I would do a long-term corporate rental and sometimes one can turn into five or 10 because if you get a great relationship with let's say hospitals, nurses, engineers, a college, uh, even a pilot school, um, you could actually get better long-term corporate rentals, better and more of them, and then you plug Airbnb in the gaps when you have gaps in the schedule. Uh, if anybody wants to know how pe how a friend of mine in Sacramento is making, I think like ten thousand a month doing this on the side. Let me know. Uh, I actually talked about this nineteen months ago on this show. And two young men who have full-time jobs actually are doing this, making seventy thousand a month gross, netting thirty to thirty-five thousand a month profit. These are bigger pockets guys. They may even be on here today. Thanks, guys. And um, uh, you can do it too. And I'm not saying you'll make seventy thousand. They're working really hard to get there. But you know, could you make five or ten thousand on the side? I bet you could. Uh, so that's a great way to go. Now, if you really want to learn how to do that, Mary Kirkpatrick, um, you can just reach out to me on my Bigger Pockets profile and I can send you a link. I don't have it in front of me. I don't even know what the link is right now, but there are, um, there are places you can go to learn more about this. And I have a friend, that same guy in Sacramento trains people for very, very reasonable, I think it's too low, price. Um, on how to do this 17 places he's got in there I think it is to find corporate tenants how to maximize your Airbnb how to do everything like really very cool stuff so yes Tristan Fungle Seth I know I pronounced that wrong please forgive me hey Tristan 
Hey Paul, I've been offered a few free mobile homes we can fix up and rent out or sell via owner financing from guys I know who bought a 30 lot trailer park. Huh, it's an extremely small town in Mayville, North Dakota with 1,800 people. That's okay, it's got a small college but rents are low and units sit vacant for a decent while. The park is also lower end. What would your approach be with this kind of investment opportunity? Tristan, you're probably not going to want to hear this, but I really want to help you and I want to tell you the truth. And I'm probably going to make some people mad, but Tristan, I wouldn't do it. Uh, there's so many reasons I wouldn't do it. I'll tell you, I've done a lot of real estate investing over the years. If I told you my history, you'd like your head would spin. Not in a good way, though, necessarily. But anyway, I've done four mobile homes and um, they were the worst. Three of the four were the worst investments I ever made. Okay, so they, they were three of the five worst investments I've ever made. And I've made a bunch, like over 100 probably now. And uh, they're awful. And now there's, if you really want to learn more about it though, there's a lady online, I think it's called Mobile Home Millions. And it's a lady and you can learn a lot from her. Now she hasn't been doing it that long, but she's trained a whole lot of people in a short time on how to do this. There's also a book out Check out Lonnie's, like Lonnie's method. Everybody in the mobile home world knows who Lonnie is, L-O-N-N-I-E. He's got a method for doing what you want to do, Tristan. And I spent a little time on this question, folks, because I think mobile homes, mobile home parks, self-storage, uh, senior living are some of the most powerful areas of real estate profitability right now. And so uh, even back to what I was asked earlier, from Lisa Reed, you know, these are areas you may want to consider jumping right into. Uh, Lizbeth, hey Lizbeth, says I want to know more about the corporate tenant strategy. <laughs> it's truly awesome. By the way, another thing you can do, Lisa Reed, in addition to what my friend Dude Real Estate told you to do, which was correct, thank you, uh, would be to um, also consider doing rent to own or lease option sandwiches, Eva Green. Hey, Eva, thanks for joining us as a beginner. Uh, lease option sandwiches, rent to own sandwiches. Um, if anybody wants to know about that, it takes a while to explain it. So I'd have to get two or three people saying, tell me about the sandwiches and then I'll get into it. Okay, so um, yeah, Lizbeth, please reach out to me again. I'm Paul Moore, my company's Wellings Capital. You can reach out to me at my Bigger Pro Pockets profile. Nabil Mahmood, hey Nabil, says, outside of an online rent payment platform, landlord locks, remote cameras, lock boxes, what are some tech that's made your life as an investor or landlord better? Well, for me, it's probably something you wouldn't really want to use, but I, I use CrowdStreet's Backroom as a platform. Um, hey, we're love it. Uh, yes, same thing. You just reach out to me and we'll give you that link. Uh, I have to go dig it out. Um, what else technology-wise? Hmm. So I'm spending a lot of time these days in investor relations. And so being a blogger, a podcast host, a podcast guest, an author, and doing these videos are the five main things that I do. But that doesn't really answer your question very well. Everything you said is really good, Nabil. That's that's the big that's some of the big tech stuff that's really helped. Of course, you know, having a great website, like my website for my multifamilies is awesome. And I'm really happy with it. And there's a company, and I don't have no real relationship with these guys, but the people that developed the website, it's called Jonah Systems, J-O-N-A-H like the Old Testament prophet that got swallowed up by a whale, Jonah Systems. Very cool, very cool websites. So, and they're not expensive. I mean, if you have a multifamily property, I would highly recommend you consider getting a Jonah Systems website. So Brad Collins, hey Brad, thanks for joining us. I just bought my first long-term rental. Congratulations, and first investment property. Would I benefit from the higher cost of a tax strategist this early in the business? So Brad, and this is for everybody, um, uh, you can get a tax strategist like Tom Wheelwright and WealthAbility, and those often cost like ten to 15000 just to get started with them. That probably is not going to make sense for the vast majority of us. There are other tax strategists, like our friend Brandon Hall, 
uh, CPA on bigger pockets. He's written a lot on bigger pockets. He would be much more realistic and he probably has all the great stuff that you need to learn from. And I bet you would be several thousand, maybe two or three. Brandon, if you're on here, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, I think getting a tax strategist would be really good. Getting a CPA would be really good, Brad, who really, really, really understands real estate. Why don't you go read my article on like 10 tax saving strategies, or maybe it's 13 for real estate investors, and then go quiz some CPAs and see if they are willing to do that, and if they know about that, if they're going to help you with that. Okay, so I am going to flip back over here to my friends on YouTube. If you haven't got a question answered by Nate Shields, dude, real estate, please put it back in, and I'll try to answer it now, uh, or if you want a second opinion. Um, hey, Flood of Sins, thanks for joining us. It's always good to have you here. Uh, Juan, okay. Eva Green, okay. Looks like you're answering back and forth with Nate. Okay, Brad, thank you. All right, that's awesome. Okay, so um, nobody's asked me about the lease option sandwich. It must not have been very compelling. Nobody's hungry? Okay. So, um, all right, who else has a question, a comment, a complaint, or a criticism? Those are like mostly C's, except questions, not a C. It could be KW if it was not spelled with a Q. Okay, not funny, trying to be funny. Did I tell you I just flew in from Chicago and boy, okay, never mind. All right, so awesome. Hey, Juan, how are you? What do you think of off market properties? Juan, it's very hard to get off market properties right now. If you're a real estate insider, this is where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, and um, it's really hard to get off market deals, but I would highly recommend you uh, trying your very best to get inside track with realtors and with property owners and get off market deals. It's definitely big in this point in the cycle. Ramon says, yes, I did ask about sandwiches. I'll get right back to you, Mary. Oh, Mary says the same thing, sorry. Oh, a bunch of us did. Okay, a lot of people asked about sandwiches. Oh yeah, Ramon, Mary. Okay, so here's the deal. If you're a beginner, you should love the strategy. If you're not a beginner, maybe you'll love it too. Now I am going to very quickly leave the camera. I promise to leave only for a second because I'm going to get books here from my friend Chris Prefontaine. Now Chris is a Bigger Pockets author. He's awesome and he's got Real estate on your terms, and I'm, I, I don't get paid for this, do I, Zach? Anyway, and he's also got um, the new real, rules of real estate investors, investing, okay? And again, I don't get paid for this, do I? Anyway, uh, seriously, these are from Chris Prefontaine along with um, others. And they've got some strategies for rent to own, lease option sandwiches, etc. Now, I haven't cracked these books yet, I just got them. But um, here's the deal. So what it's, it's kind of similar to the corporate Airbnb arbitrage thing that I explained earlier, Lizbeth. So um, here's the deal. Um, here's the quick summary. You don't own the house. It's also called subject to. You rent to own the house from the seller and you do something to improve it, add some value to it. Maybe that's just you being in the mix, adds the value. And then you rent to own it out to a buyer and you do a, you're a sandwich, it's a lease option sandwich, and you're in the middle. And so um, that's the quick summary. It's also called getting a, a house subject to the original mortgage. So subject to housing, uh, rent to own sandwich, lease option sandwich, etc. I hope that helps. Um, and basically you're trying to mark up, you know, you're paying the mortgage taxes and insurance, right, from the buyer who moved out, you're paying all those, let's say that's 800 a month, and then you're charging like 1200 a month to the person you're rent to own and selling it to, and then that 400 a month you keep, but the big payday is at closing, when you sell the house, you get the difference between the mortgage payoff and what the person buys it for. And 70 to 80% of the people fail to close. You may think that sounds bad, but that's not bad because then you get another deposit and start over and another deposit and start over. It takes an average of five. Now, Chris Prefontaine doesn't agree with me. 
he does it differently. But uh, everywhere I see nationally except for Chris, I see it takes five rent-to-own contracts to get one closing. And that's not a bad thing because you're making all that profit along the way. You don't have to own the property. Anyway, you can learn more from Chris Prefontaine. Check out his articles on Bigger Pockets. He's a friend. He's been on my podcast. I've been on his. And Bigger Pockets loves him. Thanks, Chris. Hope you heard that. Walter Dietschweiler, the CPA, says, I recommend buy and hold LLCs separate from fix and flip LLCs. Okay, this is good. Of course, it matters how much volume. Fix and flip profits, yes, that's right, result in self-employment tax, which can be reduced in an S-corp through taking a portion as wages, just like I said about my son. Buy and holds generally shouldn't be held in S-corps, which is why you'd want to do a separate LLC. Bravo. Thank you, Walter. I think your answer is better than mine. So folks, listen to Walter. I hope that made sense. Uh, I am going to, that's such an important answer that I'm going to quickly copy and paste Walter's awesome answer. Walter, if people want to get hold of you to get help with their CPA work, like what states do you do? So anyway, okay, this is from Walter. And I just put it over on the YouTube side so everybody can see. Well, I was going to put it on the YouTube side, but I can't seem to post it. Okay, there you go. Oh, it, it got me. Because, yeah, YouTube has a um, limit on word count. Okay, this is getting boring. Nate, don't let me do this. All right, so I'm going to quickly uh, copy and paste this into two separate sections so it comes out. Okay, on the YouTube. Lizbeth says, we have a property that our property manager has been trying to find a tenant for the past 90 days. They told us this time of year is slow. That's true, Lizbeth. The price is right for the area, if not lower than it should be. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I mean, do some out of pocket, like do some creative stuff. I mean, do some amazing photos. If you can stage it, stage it, and then do amazing photos, even stage the the area, like the traffic area right when they walk in. Most people make a decision on renting or buying within seconds after they walk in the front door. Consider staging that. Uh, I hope that helps. Um, so, I don't know if that's the answer. Maybe try uh, Craigslist. Maybe doing some Google ads, some Facebook ads. I mean, if you really, really wanted to get serious, you know, do some geo-targeting, geo-fencing, Facebook ads. It's going to take a real serious uh, Google, I mean, uh, Facebook advertising person to know how to do that. Veronica Larrier, thanks for joining. I know I'm in the middle of your conversation, but you said something about 401k for investing. So, there are self-directed, you can roll a self-directed, I mean, excuse me, a 401k into a solo 401k if you have a business, or you can roll it into a SEP, self-directed SEP IRA or self-directed Roth IRA in some cases, and you can invest in real estate. Now, not everybody should do this. If you're really, really thoughtful and careful investor, that'd be awesome. But if you're the kind of person who just jumps on the first thing you see, like I used to be in my late 20s, early 30s, I would not, I'd be really, really careful with doing your own self-directed IRA. I'm just saying. Daryl Hardy, Daryl Hardy, New Haven, Connecticut, suburb of New York, insurance capital of the world, real estate agent and investor. Thanks for joining, Daryl. Okay, Eva Green, how to acquire money for home repair without good credit. Um, Form alliances at your local real estate meetup groups. And someone asked me earlier, and I think Nate answered it, what about using a business card for in real estate investing? That question's long, long gone. But um, I, would, uh, I would do that as long as you have an absolute certain exit plan to refinance or sell. And if it's not almost certain, be really careful with using a business credit card. So Ajal Makbul, sorry. Hello, sir. I'm going to settle in Calgary, Canada. I have a million, no, a hundred thousand Canadian. Where should I invest to get the best results? Uh, Ajlal, um, I don't know. I would say maybe consider really, really carefully allocating that among several syndicators. So like passive real estate syndicators, funds, I personally am going to get in trouble for this probably, but I wouldn't put it in multifamily. Yes, I know I wrote a book on multifamily. I know I called it the perfect investment. 
But the perfect investment, my friends, is no longer perfect if you can't find anything that makes sense. And so uh, price wise. And so be really careful. But um, Ajlal, you can reach out to me if you want to chat about that. Uh, but I mean, I, I really don't see any better investment than um, a syndication because you don't have to do the work. You don't have to be an expert. And you can, uh, Brandon Turner made this point big time the other day. And he said, you know, I make as much money as a passive syndication investor as I do and working my tail off to do it myself. That's my opinion. That's just what I think. Mary Kirkpatrick says, subject to move it into a land trust, right? So the bank doesn't call the loan due. Yes. I didn't mention that on a red, uh, rent to own or a rent to own sandwich or a lease option sandwich. You should move it into a land trust. Remember folks, I'm not a CPA. Dude, real estate, Nate's not a CPA or an attorney. We don't play one on TV. And I really don't know if those will always work. Every time we've moved into a land trust, though, they've not called the mortgage. And it's really good for the mortgage company because they keep getting good payments when they were probably behind. By the way, the, the best way to find those deals is somebody's behind on their mortgage and they're getting ready to give up and have it foreclosed on. Or they have to move out of town for a job or a friend or whatever. And they cannot make the payments anymore. If you can find them, you could be golden. Um, okay, so Creative Control Media. Hey, hello. Thanks. It's rough up north. You're in South Jersey. Yeah, I, my friend Matt Faircloth is there too. Is 401k money considered collateral? Hey, David, that's a good question. Can you explain the question in a little more detail? Like, what do you mean exactly? I mean, I know what the words mean, but what do you... Explain the question, please. Sega Learn says, Lem, I'm sorry. If I do the BRRRRRR strategy, how do I know that the area is refinanceable? Uh, talk to lenders, talk to appraisers, talk to realtors and other investors. There's four things to do right there. That's what I would do. Um, okay, Vince Pelletier says, thanks for joining us, Vince. Student housing in Alberta is secure, especially with the downturn in the oil industry. Why would it be more secure with the downturn in the oil industry? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, Juan Hurtado. Hey, Juan. What's a good website for absent property owners? Can you please explain your question more, Juan? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, give me some more details. Nabul Mamut says rental properties make 8%, 10%. Yeah, sure. If, if you're lucky, how could that possibly replace one's W-2 income? You'd have to invest a million in rentals to make 100,000. Yeah, Nabul, Nabil, you're probably right. You know, so you could put in half a million and then go for some growth oriented stuff that doesn't throw off a lot of income and then try to double your base, your 50, your half a million, as an example, up to a million in about five or six years. And then if you really have the patience, do it again and get that million to two million. And then you can invest in safer stuff and it can replace your income at, you know, 5% return on two million, obviously. That's going to be 100,000 a year. That's a lot safer way to go. I hope that helped. Juan Hurtado says, fan can 401k money used to qualify for a bigger loan? You know, I don't know. David Mel is asking the same question. Now I get it. Okay. I don't know. Do you know dude real estate? I don't really know. Any tax strategy? I, I, I mean, I think with a smaller local bank or credit union, you have a higher chance of that. Okay. Does that make sense? Because if you go to a big bank or a national bank, probably not. Um, okay, Ali Mack. Ali Mack says, hi, Daryl. I'm, okay, Waterbury, Connecticut. Brandon Headland. Hey, Brandon. We're buying our first duplex soon. Is it best to put it in an LLC? Hey, Walter, the CPA, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. I wish, I, I wish Amanda Hahn was here. Man, if she was here, I could promote her. Look, Amanda Hahn just joined us. 
A man of Paul says, I can add a shameless plug for our new bigger. Po We've got a new author. No, no, second time author. Amanda Hahn is the author of a previous book on bigger pockets, and she is one of the she has one of, if probably not the best book written. Uh oh, I'm gonna get in trouble with the other authors on bigger pockets. Awesome, awesome book. And now she's got a new book on advanced tax strategies. So thank you. It's pre-ordered. You can pre-order it now, which is uh, February 7th, all the way up through February 20th. So for the next 13 or so days, you can pre-order Amanda Hahn's book on advanced tax strategy. Now I'm serious. What we're talking about today, folks, is what Amanda's talking about in her book. Amanda, are you talking about cost segregation? Yeah. Accelerate depreciation? Yeah. Section 179? Yeah. All kinds of other things to accelerate your write-offs and you know use mileage, maybe even home office. I'm guessing the answer is yes. And so Hayward Lovett says he's grabbing one today. And Amanda says yes. So Amanda, th Amanda thanks for joining us. And hey folks, if you've got questions for a real CPA here, we've got Walter and we've got Amanda Hahn. And so if you've got a question uh, on either side, YouTube, Facebook, or Bigger Pockets, please ask away and I'll try to relay it to um, Amanda and Walter. So where is the best place to go for pre-foreclosure listings, Israel says. Um, I would get a subscription to your local paper and actually put in keywords like foreclosure, tax sale, deed of trust, attorney, all these things, and you'll they'll kick out. I mean, Roanoke, Virginia newspaper like 15 years ago was doing this, so I'm sure in your city it'd probably even be better. But I would I would look for those and jump right on them the day they hit the newspaper, first thing in the morning, go knocking on their door, stand back, don't ask them about their foreclosure, their house, ask them about their life, ask them about their who they are, what's wrong in their life, what's going on in their life and try to help them and become a friend. Um, and, and I'm not being insincere here. I mean, you literally want to try to help people. That's what we're here for on earth, right? Right, Amanda? Okay. So uh, Tracy Pierce says, what's the average price to expect to pay for a real estate tax advisor, like a CPA or an attorney or real estate attorney and price to set up an LLC with them? Amanda Hahn, that's yours. Um, I have my answer, but I want to hear what Amanda has to say first. And Walter, feel free to weigh in as well, and then I'll give you my answer. Uh, Tracy, do not, Tracy Pierce, do not let me get away with not answering this question because I'm going to hit some more while I'm waiting to see if those folks answer. Uh, Brittany Nelson, hey, Brittany. If my father-in-law put my husband on the title of his house, can we change that to a what? To a land trust. I think so. I really do. It's really, really easy to put something in a land trust. Honestly, that's what makes me suspicious of land trusts. Now, here I am touting them, but um, they're so easy. They're so easy to get into and move stuff into. It's almost shocking. I mean, we're talking a few bucks. I mean, literally. Um, I mean, William says conventional loan for FHA for first property. I'm not sure what you're asking. So, I mean, um, help me out there. Jackie. Hey, Jackie from Fort Worth. Welcome back. I've talked to you before here. Um, how do you pronounce your last name? Guyan? Okay. Enough of that. Um, Sylvia Garcia. I really want to know about lease. Sylvia, can you give me a little more specific question? Is it the lease to own lease option sandwich? All right, Trident 72. Hi, welcome back. Inherited a property, blue collar, middle, lower income, Philadelphia, PA. What are some steps I can take when deciding whether to sell or rent? You know, I would buy Brandon Turner's book and read everything you can on BRRRR strategy. Try to figure out what your monthly profit will be stack that against oh it's win thanks jackie stack that against the profit from selling and how much you could make from selling it let's say it's 150,000 how much can you make from the 150 or how much can you make by holding and renting it and ask yourself if it's in a gentrifying area meaning a really really improving area johnny van wick says how do you get started in real estate hey johnny thanks for joining 
Christian says, best advice for an 18-year-old looking to get into rentals. Those are similar questions. Uh, what would you say, Nate Shields, dude, real estate? I mean, I, I think Nate would say, read all you can, do all the podcasts you can, get to know everything you can about real estate, read books like, um, you know, all the Brandon Turner books and these Chris Prefontaine books, maybe some of these books I mentioned earlier about uh, apartment investing, and then uh, go to your local real estate meetup, educate yourself and find a mentor says dude real estate okay um and then like i said i would do these corporate rental strategies i would consider the corporate rental the airbnb arbitrage i would also consider rent to own and lease option sandwiches also known as subject to investing all right james ellis says would you recommend a new investor in with no purchases yet focusing specifically on creative financing methods like owner finance and subject to James, I'm probably going to get criticized here by, and that's okay. I don't think owner financing is like super, like works that well anymore. I haven't seen an owner financing deal that worked in a long time. Don't shout me down. No, go ahead and shout me down. I don't care. So I, yeah, I would, I would totally, if you don't have a lot of money. Oh, and then you wrote back. I have 25,000 available to invest. That's awesome. Well, if you have 25,000 invest, I would consider the corporate Airbnb strategy because you could furnish the Airbnb or the corporate housing real nice. Don't, I mean, don't do it if you don't like it, but I'm just saying if you, that's something you'd be interested in. Um, I would consider that and the creative financing. And by the way, there may be owner financing tricks of the trade that I don't know. I just haven't seen too many that worked. What about you, Nate Shields, dude, real estate? Siga Lem says, when do you get the tax benefit from a property? When you rent it out? Yeah, I mean, I think you get more tax benefits by buying and holding, renting out, than you would buy a quick flip property, if that's the, what you're comparing. Uh, David, I mean, you get the, the benefits when you depreciate, you know, like when you do the cost seg studies, when you do section 179, when you use the tools available to you. Um, but yeah, rental properties typically. What's the stigma against co-op owners seeking money for investment properties? Co-op is paid in full. David Mel, don't know. Anybody else know? I would love to have an answer to that. Like I said at the beginning, you guys should answer each other's questions because there's a ton more wisdom collectively here than Nate and I have, right? So Chris Corey says, why would a property sale be restricted to low income financing and no investors? Yeah, HUD does that because they really want to promote home ownership and not just investors sweeping up all the best deals in answer to your question. Alex Parrish. Hey, Alex, I'm currently doing an owner finance deal from a friend. That's great. Maybe I was wrong. Alexander Curtis. Great stuff today, Paul. Thank you. Is the due on sale clause a major concern with acquiring property with lease options. Alexander, honestly, it should be, but I've never heard one time of the due on sale clause being called, not once. Now people put them in land trusts and people put them in land trusts for that reason. I, I just don't think it ever gets called. I don't think the due on sale clause ever calls. It gets called. Waleed Hamdan, sorry, didn't catch what you said earlier. Can you elaborate on corporate rental mixed with Airbnb. That's really cool. Yeah. Wa Waleed, I'm sorry. I said your name wrong. Um, yeah. Basically you rent something, you fix it up and you re-rent it out on corporate leases for like double what you're renting it for. Of course, you've got other stuff involved. Like, you know, you've got expenses like utilities, but uh, you can make a significant profit doing corporate housing and Airbnb, just filling it in the gaps. Corporate housing is so much easier and you get like maybe 80, 90% of the profits. Uh, DeAndre says, please explain a 1031 exchange. Basically, we're running out of time here. You can exchange one property for another and you don't have to do it directly. You can put it into a third party. The third party will hold your proceeds from your sale and then you'll use those proceeds to buy something else. You've got a very short time to make that work, like 45 days to make your selections. Okay, so I'm running out of time. We're in the last mile sprint here. The fire round, as they say. So I'm going to, it's not right, I know. So um, 
Anyway, I'm going to really quickly start answering these questions really quick. By the way, I do a call on Wednesdays sometimes. And uh, so he'll, I can't explain the benefits of using land trust, except it keeps it in a, it, like, it, it shields the name of the owner from like the public, if that helps. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask this, I'm going to hit these really, really quick. And if you want to jump on my Wednesday call, just reach out to me and, uh, Nate Shields and I will try to answer your questions in more detail if possible. Sean Patrick says, hi, Paul, what's the best way for my wife and I to obtain my in-laws house with the least amount of tax liability house? Do you want to steal their house, Sean? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hey, Sean, put it in a land trust and um, you don't even have to have a closing. I mean, you just like you basically have them transfer into a land trust. It's not clear who the land trust is owned by, and then you take ownership of the land trust, or you take a uh, beneficial ownership, like 99% ownership, and you keep them 1% uh, on there. So that's what I hear, and I believe that'll work. Amanda Hahn says, yes, depreciation starts when a property is available for rent. And there may not be any tax on that, Sean. I mean, maybe even just do a sale, like maybe just sell from one to there. Maybe there won't be a huge tax, depending on what state you're in. Amanda, yes. Oh, so that's when depreciation starts, when it's available for rent. No, I didn't know that, Amanda. Thank you. Pam Morrison says, any advice, suggestions for rental arbitrage? What do you say to the property owners? And should you go to big complexes or small? Yeah, you can go to both, Pam, and you should tell them the truth. You should tell them the absolute truth because they're going to know very, very soon anyway. Okay? So you need to tell them exactly what you want to do. Now, Amanda Hahn's got a better answer than me. Again, in-laws can gift the property, no gift taxes, but check, your, check with your CPA. Great. Okay, Sean, hopefully that helped. Amanda Hahn is there to help if you need help. Um, and her book is going to be amazing. Okay, Tracy says, don't forget about my question. Tracy, you asked, what's the average price to expect to pay for a real estate advisor, real estate CPA, or real estate attorney, and price to set up an LLC? Uh, Amanda Hahn didn't answer this yet unless I missed it. You probably did. Um, I would say three or 4000 to get some really, really good advice from a CPA like Amanda. Oh, oops. I shouldn't say that, Amanda. You should probably weigh in on that. But someone like Brandon Hall, some other CPAs I know, would probably charge three to five thousand, three to four. And then, as far as setting up an LLC, honestly, you can do it yourself for maybe a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred bucks. Somebody can tell me I'm wrong. Maybe uh, Lisa Reed says, "What would you say about investing in duplexes?" Yes, I would do it totally um, if you can find a really good one, especially if you want to house hack, Lisa. Um, so heal, you're welcome. Brittany Nielsen, before we run out of time, I want to say, I appreciate you, Paul. I'm enjoying your podcast as a new subscriber. Thank you. God bless. Hey, Brittany. Thank you. God bless you. Appreciate that. Uh, David May says, hi, Paul. Can you post how to contact with you to get your Wednesday call? David, um, oh, Amanda says I was right on the fees. Okay. So ho hopefully I was right, uh, right on that, Tracy. I'm glad. Um, you know, um, it's Wednesday at noon Eastern if we do it this week, and you're going to have to reach out to me at my um, at my uh, Bigger Pockets profile. And so it's Paul Moore and Wellings Capital, and I'm just going to put a little comment in so you can see me. I'm Paul Moore, Wellings Capital, and you can just reach out to me on my Bigger Pockets profile. I try to do that to go into take a deeper dive on some of these questions we can't get to today. Uh, I don't make anything from it. I'm not trying to get anything out of it. I'm just trying to help. Um, Stephen Hall says, how much to set aside for monthly for capital expenditures? Ugh, I don't know. Stephen, maybe 50 bucks per unit per month. Like if it's a small apartment, maybe a hundred depending on the age. That sounds pretty steep. Um, Waleed says, so you're saying I would sublease with the owner's permission? Absolutely. Okay, Mary, yeah, I'd love to have you on the Wednesday call. All right, disadvantage, advantage of using low money down loans, says Prohm's Construction. Well, I mean, if it's low money down, you know, more leverage means the advantage is you can possibly leverage your profits over much 
you, you can make much, much more money. But if you lose money, that leverage works exactly the same way against you. So if you're 50% leveraged, you can maybe double the profit on the asset between the profit on the asset to the profit on the equity. But if you're 90% leveraged, you can 10x the ratio of profit on the asset to profit on the equity, but you can also 10x lose it if it goes down. So if it goes down 10% in value, you can lose the property. I mean, that's pretty bad. So, um, hey, Daniel Tizer, you're welcome from America. Thanks. You're in from Israel. So glad. Thank you. Royal Scott Smith is asking $7,000. Okay, that's not just to set up an LLC, is it, Tracy Pierce? Um, it might be a lot of tax strategy involved there. Okay, so we're going to come down to the very end here. So if you didn't get a question answered on any of these three platforms, you need to copy and paste it in right away, and I'll see if Nate Shields, dude real estate, is even still with us. He's no longer with us. No. Um, and I'll see if I can answer it. Puneet says, what are the tax implications between joint ownership or common in ownership? Which is more beneficial as far as taxes are concerned? Amanda Hahn, I hope you heard that question. Can you answer it? Because I have no idea. Tracy Pierce says, Scott Royal Smith is charging 7000 for tax strategy. I will tell you in defense of Scott Royal Smith that Tom Wheelwright charges probably thirteen or 14000 or more for tax strategy. And every single person I know who's gone to Tom Wheelwright said it was worth more than that. Tracy Pierce says Anderson's charging 10,000. Wow. James Ellis says, you rock Paul, where did you say we could find corporate housing sponsors? James, uh, just connect with me on my Bigger Pockets profile and I'll try to give you that information. Tanya Green, thank you. It's very sweet of you. Um, Okay, so we're going to wrap this up and wind it down and all those acronyms. And I really am amazed I get to do this. Thank you, Amanda Hahn, for joining us. Thank you, Walter CPA. Thank you, everybody. I can't believe I get to do this. Zach Gwynn, thank you for setting this up. Bigger Pockets, thank you so much. Like I said, I can't believe I get to do this and be with you all most Fridays. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great weekend. If you're enjoying the foot or whatever of snow out in Keystone, Breckenridge, Denver, uh, enjoy it. If you're enjoying the tornadoes, what? In Charlotte uh, or the crazy weather all over the country. I hope you have a great weekend. Um, and again, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question, but I really do appreciate all of you. And I look forward to catching up with you next Friday, if not before. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Fang from Minneapolis or St. Paul, and we'll talk again soon. Take care.